fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. In the last five decades, developed countries have spent over $2 trillion in foreign aid. And yet, unfortunately, we haven't seen huge, meaningful change in the developing world. Nearly 3 billion people live with less than $2 a day. Ladies and gentlemen, it is because of this we are ready to improve the developing world. We are so proud to propose. Ladies and gentlemen, as your first speaker, I'm going to get into some contentions. But before I do that, I'd like to clarify our stance, our burden, and our model for this debate. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to make our stance clear. In this debate, we are not talking about increasing or decreasing aid. We are not talking about which countries this aid should actually go to. We are not talking about whether aid in and of itself is actually effective. This debate is about the following. Both sides will allocate X billion of dollars in development aid. Our side will allocate a larger percentage towards education, and their side will allocate the status quo or some other amount where educational aid is not the primary contribution. The winning team is the one that actually proves, you know, the best, better allocation. Please note we are not decreasing the amount spent on humanitarian aid, which is for use in crisis and immediate needs. We define educational aid as aid spent on building schools, training teachers, and accessibility to schools. This aid would be based on the needs and climate of the areas in which aid is being given, focusing on primary and secondary education. In order to win this debate, we need to prove that the countries in which the EU currently gives aid, namely Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe, will be better off as a result of this different new proportional change in the type of aid given. By better off, we mean that they're actually going to have a higher quality of life and socioeconomic status of that entire country. Our yardstick in this debate is that education is the access point to all of the necessary rights given by other forms of aid, while also providing long-term benefits that we will discuss in our case. Ladies and gentlemen, for you today, we have six contentions. First, why the EU in particular? Ladies and gentlemen, we would tell you that the EU mandate is very much focused on equality and human rights. Coming from an approach like this, it would make sense for them to actually want to prioritize education because oftentimes education is one of the best ways to actually you know, achieve equality through, say, like meritocracy. Furthermore, the EU is home to some of the world's best education system because of the current existing diversity. The culture of the EU is very education-oriented, and they have succeeded with this education-first development as a result of practice. Education offers a good return on investment, a more sophisticated workforce overseas, and a more developed economy that can actually benefit the EU, no thank you, with more trade partners and make the global economy more stable and ultimately better connected in the long term. Overall, the EU benefits from this increased educational aid that it will provide. Let's get into contention number two. The importance of education. Ladies and gentlemen, education is a basic human right that is unlikely to be provided by many governments within the status quo, unlike other infrastructure, unlike necessities. We think this because it's so fundamental that everyone should have access to it, but it is a basic human right. In the status quo, this isn't possible because oftentimes you have governments that don't actually prioritize like, education when they distribute their own budget. For example, we would give you the example of like corporations which have an incentive to build roads and infrastructure such as Coca-Cola, which is known for its placement of infrastructure in the developing world. No one has an incentive to build schools and provide education, making it a uniquely important aspect that we actually have to solve, because it's a current problem in the status quo that you know, people, government bodies, aren't actually paying enough attention to actually trying to build and like, establish better education programs. With other kinds of foreign aid, you're only giving the country what they need, which is a handout. With education, you're giving them the ability to actually get what they need on their own which is more sustainable in the long term, ladies and gentlemen. This allows countries to be more self-sufficient after a time, rather than always being reliant on aid safe from the West. We want a solution that doesn't just like do a quick fix of this issue, but actually solves it permanently. We think that the fundamental difference between, say, like food and education is that one is renewable, the other is not. No, thank you. Furthermore, we would tell you that education is actually one of the least corruptible forms of aid, because the education is sanctioned by the E sanctioned by the EU, there's a certain degree of legitimacy and objectivity. Even if this wasn't true, there are certain parts of education that are incorruptible. Things like math, things like science, that are actually you know, universal like concepts. On the other hand, things like money or food can be used in corrupt ways by corrupt governments. Point number three, access to school. Under the status quo, it's difficult for parents to afford the costs associated with schooling. And a majority of communities in these developing countries actually have very limited infrastructure. 
So physically going to school is actually not a reality for many students. When you have to travel two hours along a very unsafe route to get to school, there's not a lot of incentive that you're actually going to want to go to school. When we invest in education, one aspect of that is actually building schools, as we mentioned in our model. No, thank you. Schools become more common throughout the country, and a lot more regions will have easy and nearby access. As a result, we'll see more families sending their kids to school and more people ultimately getting educated. In communities that have made schools more accessible to students, there has been an increase in test scores and commitment to school because now a pupil's primary focus is on school, not actually the transportation that it takes to actually get there. Let's get to the fourth point of economic benefits. Sure. But if people can't even travel to these schools safely because, let's say, there are like, you know, terrorist groups out there like Boko Haram, which would kill them, how are they incentivized to even go to school if they're scared of these groups? Okay, sure. Our first response would be that we think this is a huge generalization. We would tell you out of like the many different like sub-Saharan African nations and like nations in Europe, we would tell you that there's not like a whole bunch of like problems that are as big as Boko Haram in these nations. But furthermore, no thank you, we think that we should try our best to establish these school programs simply because the status quo is far worse. The status quo actually has like say no infrastructure, no teachers, no schools. We think we're at least trying to solve the problem and at least more kids are actually going to be getting education on our side of the house. We would tell you that an extra year of good schooling lifts a country's economic growth by 1%. In many countries, with each additional year of schooling, people earn 10% higher wages. These earnings in turn contribute to national economic growth. Why? Because education leads to two things. First, more people creating businesses because they'll have the knowledge you know, how to create these things. And second, they'll have the knowledge to carry out improvements with the education, <coughs> etc. Therefore, no thank you, if we focus primarily on education instead of others, the people will have the knowledge and incentive to actually want to improve themselves, want to improve their society, no thank you. So in the long term, our policy is a lot better. But let's get into these three ways that it's actually better. First of all, the value of labor. When people have a better education, they're able to pursue higher level and thus more specialized jobs. These specialized jobs ultimately have more value to society than the alternative, which is manual labor. We would tell you in the status quo, you know, there's a lot of gaps in society because there's little education, little specialization. We solve this on our side of the house. But second, let's get into this idea of the poverty cycle. When you get an education, you're likely to get a more specialized job, a higher paying job. Jobs that require a higher level of education generally are better paying. I'm going to give you the example of, say, Madagascar, where the average income is 18 cents an hour, the nation is being exploited, and the population is being used as a sweatshop workforce primarily. Because of the basic lack of education, ladies and gentlemen, they're unable to be employed, employed as anything else. When you introduce this, this condition improves. Ultimately, you break the poverty cycle as opposed to the status quo, where you go through an endless cycle of manual labor, lack of education, and poverty, where now you have skills and you have a monetary means to help yourself. But finally, let's talk about more informed financial decisions. At the baseline with education, people are going to be more financially responsible because they understand more about the basics of finance and economics. This means better decision making and money allocation and financial decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, on side proposition, we stand for what is best for the long term. We stand for what is best for future generations. We are ready to improve the developing world, and it is for those reasons that we are so proud to be part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. I would like to call Leader of Opposition, Alex, to open the debate.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker. What would the EU's development aid program look like on our side of the house today? First off, we'd like to make EU aid um, a secondary, or this education is secondary as opposed to primary part of our budget. And we think that this doesn't mean that none of our money is going to go to education, and it doesn't mean that the education won't be an insignificant part of our budget. It just means that there are going to be some things we'd rather spend more money. Right now, the EU spends about 5% of its budget on education, for de or on development of education. We think that that's something we would go with. In fact, we'd be even okay if it went up to 10%, for example, right? But we think that anything over that is going to be excessive. But second, we'd also tell you that we'd like to change the way that education money is spent. We'd like to see about 70% of our education aid spent on traditional primary and secondary education, and we would try our best to make sure that talented kids from all socioeconomic classes would be able to attend these schools. However, we also like to spend 30% of this budget on specialized education. For example, in villages who don't have food or farms, we would set up classes to teach them how to farm. If they don't have water and they can't build wells, we would set up classes so we teach them how to build wells and we teach them how to use those wells. We think that under this model, it's going to be much better and we're going to be much more specific in our education, which is actually going to have more tangible effects than what they're doing. But third off, we'd say that we'd spend, what would we spend the rest of the money on? We think we should spend them on a few main ideas. First off, healthcare in terms of hospitals, clean water, and sanitation. But second, for infrastructure projects like roads, telecommunications, and electricity. And next, we look at basic economic development programs, like purchasing equipment for resource extraction or agricultural development. And finally, we provide funding for police forces and military to provide security. That's what we support on our side of the house. Now let's look at burdens. We think that the burden on side government today in this debate is to show you that all the things that the EU's development aid program, that education is the most important and primary thing the money needs to be spent on. And we think that on our side, we need to prove that there are more important things that we need to be primarily focusing on for this development aid. Now with that done, let's get into some refutation of the points that they brought to you today. And the first thing that we had an issue with was their model, right? We think that they never really defined what primary is going to be. Is that going to be simply more than the rest, where we're doing like 21 for education, 20, 20, 20, 19, for example? Are we going to be doing 50% as a clear majority? We think they need to clarify that on their side of the house. But first now, they bring you this point about, well, the EU essentially wants to prioritize equality. When we have more education, it's going to create equality necessarily, right? We don't think that's necessarily true, because we think that even if you build schools, in a lot of these cases, people can't go to school because they need to help their families on these farms to actually get food for their family, right? If they go to school, they can't necessarily do that. So in that sense, it's actually going to grow even more of a gap and disparity because of the fact that it's now only going to be these high socioeconomic classes that are able to attend school under their model. Second thing that we brought to you was that, or second thing that they brought to you was that education is a basic human right, and essentially that we have the incentive to build schools. We say that food is also an essential right. We say that water is an essential right. We say that shelter and safety. These are immediate problems we have to deal with, not education. If people don't have food and water, they're not going to be able to go to school. But even if they could go to school, they can't focus in that school because the fact that they don't have food to actually be able to think about what they're learning. All right, next they bring you this point about, well, it's essentially, um, they physically can't get to these schools, we're not going to be making it more regional, right? We asked about POI about these militant groups, but we're going to prevent them from going, right? Their simple response was, well, we hopefully they won't actually do anything, and that was a large general mobilization. But ladies and gentlemen, we see in Afghanistan and Pakistan, for example, we have the Taliban who threatens to go out and kill girls who attempt to go to school, right? Their model actually isn't going to address this problem. We think that in this scenario, parents aren't going to want to send their kids to school because they're afraid they're going to get killed every single day. Next point that they bring to you was that economic growth, essentially they're going to be starting their own businesses, right? Well, first response, we say that the problem is in these countries, there isn't actually the infrastructure, there aren't actually the jobs available for these high-skilled labor workers, right? The problem is in these countries, if you do have a good education, you aren't going to stay there, you're going to move to another country that is more developed, that actually offers you those positions. But on top of that, we think that even if those positions are available, they generally come from multinational corporations. The problem is those multinational corporations don't hire local workers, they hire foreign workers instead to do the job. So even if you create them, the locals aren't actually the ones benefiting. But then last, we bring in this idea about better financial decisions. And we think that even if you don't have money or you don't have food, it's going to be very tough to make good financial decisions. Now that we're done that, let's take a look at our case. Right? We say that the EU itself says there's three main goals of development aid. First, to promote human rights. Second, to accelerate economic development. Third, to promote diplomatic and economic cooperation. I'm going to touch on the first two. Frederick's going to talk on the next. So let's start about why do we promote better human rights? Well, what does the EU consider to be a human right? They have obvious ones like the right to security, safety, democratic freedom. 
but they also say that they attach the same importance to economic, social, and cultural rights as they do to civil and political rights. So based on the EU's definition, the condition of human rights in these countries we're talking about are deplorable. 52% of children are stunted in Southeast Asia. Over a million people die of malaria each year. People lack water to drink or sanitation to keep themselves safe from diseases. And when they get those diseases, there is no hospital infrastructure for them to go to. Instead, they have armed groups like Boko Haram in Nigeria kidnapping and killing many of their family members. If the EU actually wants to fulfill its goal on human rights obligations, it has to deal with this. All right, so why can't primarily funding education do this? Well, we'd say for four reasons. First off, we'd say that you pray that these kids don't die every day because of these armed gangs who are going to be ending up trying to kill them, right? But second of all, they may not under necessarily understand exactly what's going on in class if they're starving and if they have diseases. But third, even if everything works out, you don't know if these kids are actually going to have a job when you graduate. But finally, and most importantly, lots of parents aren't going to send their kids to school before these issues are resolved. If you don't resolve the issues, it doesn't matter what infrastructure you put, they're not going to go anyways. Next thing what we like to say, though, is that there are, there are farmers in Nigeria, for example, who need kids who are farming on their farm or, or growing food on their farms. We think that's something they need to focus on. But the fact is, unless we can solve these issues, children don't actually go to school. We take Nigeria, for example, which has 59% of its youth attending school, even when school is readily available to the greater portion of its population. So why is focusing more money on these areas, like policing, resources, and infrastructure, better promote these human rights? We say that first off, we help these countries fight armed groups and access their rights to security by sending them money to fund police forces. But second, we directly give them the agricultural tools, shelter, and sanitation they need to maintain health. Third off, we say that we also fund things like resource extraction, building projects, and other forms of economic development. We aren't saying uh, that side proposition can fund these areas as well, nor are we saying that our side is going to create a perfect world. We just think that focusing on these issues that are prime, that are immediate rather than education is a more cost-effective use of our money. The second off, why do we better accelerate economic growth? The first thing I'd like to ask is what educated people in these developing countries choose to do. And the sad reality is, Mr. Speaker, even if they love their country, they understand that they need to go somewhere else to get these jobs. If we look at 90% of Guinean Nigerian skilled workers are expatriates, they've left the country to work somewhere else. We think that there's two reasons that happens. First off, because in many cases there simply aren't enough jobs for them to fill. There's lots of doctors, there's not many hospitals. There's lots of engineers, there's not many building projects for them. Second off, we'd say that even if these jobs exist, they don't go to local workers, they go to multinational Chinese uh, or they go to multinational corporations. Like we'd like to bring in the example of Chinese multinational corporations in Africa, who when they go in, hire 95% Chinese foreigners to actually build these jobs instead of local people. But why is this so harmful, right? Because even if proposition is able to create a generation of intelligent and skilled people, many of them will end up leaving because they need to look out for their own interests. Although it's true they might like their country and return later, they also care about their family and having a high paying job. So suddenly the EU is now wasting billions of dollars on this economic development these countries never get. So what our side of the house best resolves it is because now we're going to be putting this development aid to building projects like roads, canals, and ports for trade. These are things that actually help grow the economy. But at the same time, we'd like to give engineers something to do. We'd like to fund hospitals so doctors also have something to do. Finally, we'll fund resource extraction so these chemical engineers have something to do. The distinction between our side and side government today is in that side government's world, multinational corporations is the best they're going to get. They're going to give away their jobs to foreigners, something we don't stand for today. Why we're so excited to follow. Leader of opposition, we'd like to call on stage the Deputy Prime Minister and
<clears throat> if building more buildings, giving food to every starving child, and giving money to every person in poverty was the way to deal with developing nation problems, we think that with the 88 billion euros that the EU spends on foreign aid every year, we would have solved this problem already. It's because of that proposition we understand the nature of developing countries' issues and how exactly we go about tackling these issues. We're very proud to be continuing to propose on our second house. Okay, so as your second speaker, I'm first going to be going through some thorough recommendations, taking down everything they've said, and then I'm going to be going into explaining you our final last two contentions on the second house. But first, let's deal with some of Alright, so the first speaker, Alex, came up to you today and told you about how we're going to have better, how we should allocate our money to better human rights, how we should have, you know, the right to security, they lack sanitation, something about Boko Haram, and they won't understand schools if they're starting. A couple of responses. Firstly, we tell you that this is an extremely large mischaracterization of the situation in Africa, in sub Saharan Africa. The stereotypical image of extreme poverty and starvation being the norm in Africa has been grossly over exaggerated. We tell you that for the majority, the workers there, no, they, oh, sorry, the workers there are all in extreme poverty and all they need is a bowl of rice. We tell you the majority are in the middle or lower class that are stuck in this medial like cycle of poverty because they're unable to get an education to push themselves into further levels of jobs, right? We think this is extremely important to remember. But secondly, we'd also take you that this idea of like right to sanitation, this idea of the right to food and the right to like giving foreign aid, that's not mutually exclusive to our side of the house because we're still giving humanitarian aid, ladies and gentlemen. There's a huge difference between humanitarian aid and development aid. We think this is extremely important to remember. Okay. Second, there's also the idea about how, you know, on their side of the house, there's this idea of a brain drain, how all the educated people leave anyways, so there's not that big of a difference. Okay, first of all, we tell you that brain drain happens much less, and there's a much less likely possibility of brain drain if we have better education infrastructure in the existing country, ladies and gentlemen. No, thank you. We tell you that when we have this more educated cohort of people, it will generate economic activity in of itself. Because now we have more intelligent people, now we have more entrepreneurs, now we have more you know, ability to have these innovations. We tell you this brain drain idea really falls to our side of the house, because under their side of the house, they're still brain drain. Under our side of the house, we're trying to make this brain drain a little bit better by creating this basic education infrastructure that is so important, right? Okay, let's get into some reconstruction now. My partner actually brought to you four distinct ideas that they really only responded to two of them. Let's deal with what they actually said to us. Okay, firstly, we talked to you about this idea about how on our side of the house we align with EU principles of equality, human rights, education, right? We told you how we're actually fulfilling the EU mandate, no thank you, by passing this resolution. What did we hear from their side of the house? They told you, no, even if you build schools, you know, the children will still have to work for their parents, etc., etc. We tell you, okay, first of all, this idea of, again, this is a huge over-exaggeration of the large, vast majority of the people that are going to be enjoying these schools, right? We think parents are going to want to send their children, A, because they're not dying of poverty, like side opposition would have you believe, but B, because they understand, no thank you, and they recognize the direct link between education and success in the workforce, and they understand these large, long-term benefits. So that's why we think they still make it, right? <coughs> Again, about this idea of how we're going to have a return in investment, and that's why the EU is going to be so invested in this. Because when these economies eventually develop more, that's going to be beneficial to everyone. We heard no response to this. Okay, second point. We told you about the importance of education and how currently governments don't actually prioritize this education. We told you our handouts aren't good, they're not sustainable, that's why we need to catch education. <coughs> Unfortunately, we didn't hear much engagement, so I have nothing really to say to reconstruct. Okay, so no, thank you. Thirdly, my partner told you about this idea of accessibility to schools. We told you how transport is a long reason why people don't actually go to schools, how cost is difficult. All I told you was this idea, okay, no, because for the vast majority of sub-Saharan Africa, Boko Haram exists, and that's why they're too scared to go to school. We tell you, first of all, this is a large overgeneralization of the sub-Saharan African region. Boko Haram, no thank you, does not exist in every single country that we're going to be implementing this infrastructure. Secondly, we still think because of this, we're going to be reaping the extreme benefits of education in the vast majority of places. And we think this in of itself is justification for spending money on this kind of educational aid. We think thirdly, even if we did accept their premise that they were scared, we think the whole point of our resolution is we increase access accessibility so it's less likely that they're going to be scared if the school is closer, right? We think this is extremely important and extremely beneficial to remember. Finally, no thank you, we brought to you this idea of economic benefits. We told you how with schooling you're going to get better jobs, we give you a multitude of support benefits. They really only responded to one point, one point that my partner brought to you about the higher value of labor. They told you this idea of brain drain again. We think we've dealt with it adequately enough. We'll tell you under their side of the house, brain drain is much worse than our side of the house where we have some form of education. No thank you. Okay. Now that we've thoroughly dealt with all of their education and all of their infrastructure, I'd like to get 
get to my final two constructive points on the side of the house. First thing, I'm going to be talking to you about external harms, external benefits to this resolution. First thing, we think that death rates can decrease through education when citizens learn how to handle diseases and illness properly as well as daily hygiene. We bring you the example that in many developing worlds, there are thousands and thousands of children dying of diseases that could be prevented with basic hygiene, like diarrhea, right? We think this is extremely important to remember. Second, sexual education, unfortunately, does not exist in the developing world. There's a general lack of knowledge when it comes to protecting yourself against STDs and unwanted pregnancy. With more education, women can learn how to keep themselves safe and keep their bodies safe. Yes. Ma'am, why, is, why isn't this education specific? Why do we have to spend billions of dollars teaching children in okay. Nigeria how to read all of our toys? Okay, so I think the fundamental difference here is that when you allocate a lot of money to other resources, the quality doesn't necessarily improve. Because when you have billions of dollars in food, you're just going to have you know more food. But when you have billions of dollars in education, the quality of education increases, the accessibility of education increases, and these are all benefits that you get by funneling more money into education. And that's why we need distinctly more money. But going on another point, Third point, external benefits. We have this idea of racism. We think in many countries there are cultural discrimination. This changes because within school, when people interact with different races, this breaks down cultural stereotypes of different demographics, right? The education system generally promotes the idea of racial equality. We think when this is ingrained from a primary level, this is very beneficial. Four, less extremism. On our side of the house, we lower potentials for extremely extremist groups like the Madrasas in Afghanistan, where it's a youth gang that goes around recruiting youth who don't know what they're doing. No thank you, right? We think that when we teach these children these proper morals and proper values from a very basic level, this increases this trend as well. Okay, let's get into our second point about corruption. We tell you that for the most part, when the population is uneducated, they're not aware of their rights, and they don't understand enough that <coughs> one of percent is corruption. Indeed, studies have found a high correlation between low levels of education and high corruption, right? When we invest in education, no thank you, in the developing world, we're creating a more informed population in twofold. Firstly, on the most basic level, we think people more, less people are worried about you know, surviving, they can become more political, politically aware when they're in these schools. Second, they can become more informed about their rights and their governments through these education systems, because education fosters critical thinking and a desire to become more informed and politically aware. This is the nature of human curiosity, right? We think at the end of the day, an increased public awareness means that people are going to demand for more transparency in the government. This gets rid of a lot of the corruption that we see in the current developing nations in the structure. How does this change take place? We think that governments at the end of the day, no matter how corrupt, ultimately have a vested interest in keeping their people happy and complacent in order to maintain public order and productivity, so they will respond to these kinds of public pressure. We also allow for more democratization to take place. People become more aware of what principles of democracy and civil rights, and when their government is undemocratic, they again create public pressure to democratize. We recognize on our side of the house that we're not eliminating corruption, nor is any of this happening overnight. But we think that there's going to be an eventual improvement, especially when we place an emphasis on education, as opposed to locating a major 5% or 10% on their side of the house. We think that's the distinction we need to make. The quality of education on our side of the house goes up drastically. That's the difference here. That's why we really think we're taking the debate. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, we want to create sustainability. We don't want to just give these people a fish. We want to teach them how to fish, so we don't have to come back and give them a fish every time they're in trouble. At the end of the day, it's these principles that we stand for, and it's why I'm extremely proud to continue to to the Deputy Prime Minister, now the Deputy Leader of Opposition, to continue the opposition's case.
Mr. Speaker, when you teach a man how to fish when the river runs dry, when the water is diseased, and when he might just die because of a terrorist attack on the way to the river, we really don't think that that is going to help him. We think all that's going to do is he's going to die. We don't think that's going to help. We think that's what side proposition is really telling you today. And our side is telling you that we're going to actually fill that river with water before we teach the man how to fish. So that's actually efficient, right? So what? So as the second speaker, what am I going to be doing for you? Firstly, I'm going to be doing some uh, rebuttal, and then I'm going to be doing some reconstruction, and I'm going to be moving on to my own point about how this actually benefits the European Union. So what did they really tell you? They firstly told you this idea that, well, there's an EU mandate, so there's human rights, and education is a human right. We say two responses. Firstly, we agree, yes, education is a human right. Therefore, still spending money on it. We're not saying we're going to not spend money on it at all. right? But secondly, we have to recognize that there's more rights to you know, just education. We say there's many things, such as like the right to security, the right to life, which we think is the most important thing. Because if you're dead, you can't access any other rights, because we think that's just how it is. right? You you can't, you know, go to school if you're dead, right? So what, they, so what next do they tell you? They tell you, okay, well then people will now go to school more easily, right? Because we're going to create more accessibility. We tell you a few things, right? Alex has already told you this. Firstly, if you're killed on your school, when you have like militant groups, we can't attack you on there. We think that when you don't have your security, like guaranteed, you're going to die, and you're, you're not going to want to go to school, right? So it's not more accessible. Secondly, we see when you're like starving to death, you're not going to be like going to school because you're trying to find food, not trying to like learn how to like, you know, one plus one, right? Like we don't think that's just how it works. People try to secure their own security before they try to like go and learn stuff, right? And then they talk about this idea, well, you know, schooling improves economy because now people are going to be able to like find higher paying jobs. We say that's great if there is higher paying jobs in the first place. We say if there is because the infrastructure isn't there, we say like if there isn't enough corporations to actually be able to uphold this number of like educated people, we say that okay, you're gonna have a ton of people who's educated, but all they're going to do is do lower end jobs. We see this in China, right? Everyone has a college degree, but so what? There's still a lot of people unemployed or people with a college degree working in like a supermarket. We don't see how really like education without like opportunities is actually going to help them, right? And then they say this idea of like poverty cycle. We say once again, if you don't have the opportunities, then you can't like find a job. You're not going to get out of your poverty cycle. We say it only works in Western liberal democracies because there are the opportunities to uphold that. That's why we put like a very strong emphasis in Western liberal democracies on education. But if they don't have the infrastructure to uphold like educated people and like, for them to find higher paying jobs, we say no, that's not going to work at all. Right? Then they talk about this idea of like fiscally smart and like uh, this is going and also this idea like many things like sexual uh, like uh, sex ed or things like that. We say okay, but most people are going to be firstly really like engaged even in their model, mostly in the primary level. I don't know about you, but when I was six years old, I was not taught sex ed. I was not taught how to like avoid these kind of diseases. I was not taught how to like do farming. I was not taught how to do my finances. I don't think that's like what they teach you in primary school. They teach you one plus one, which doesn't really uh, like benefit them on like a primary, like a very principal level when they're simply like farmers, right? When you go and farm, we don't think you really need all the maths and all the English in the world for you to help you farm. We don't think that's just how it works, right? So we think like those things aren't necessary for the people to like maintain their basic like living necessities, which they aren't guaranteed. Go ahead. Okay, are you aware that if you have a more educated population, they make they make their own companies and businesses and create opportunities for themselves in their society? Okay, we say if there's the infrastructure for them to do that, right? We say there's no roads there. We say there's no hospital there. We say the majority of the population is dying of malaria, dying of starvation, dying of thirst because they don't have access to clean water. We say no, they're not going to have like opportunities to do that because all they're doing is really worrying about their own safety, right? So we think that's not like something. And then you talk about this idea like racism and less extremism. We think that's just a fringe point they try to come up with last minute, right? We say, okay, well, if we look at it, right, most people who have, like, great cultural divides, they don't live together, right? We don't see the Jewish people and the, like, Palestinians living on the same ground, going to the same school, and then they're going to be like, okay, we understand each other more now. No, we don't say that's the case, right? We think that generally, when there's, like, huge cultural divides, they generally live in different areas. They're going to go to school with, like, the same, like, people from the same cultures. We don't see how this is going to, like, create less racism or less extremism. We even really don't see how that works. They, then they talk about this idea like less education, right? And, and this means like, you know, more like uh, 
dic dictatorial rule, we say firstly, right, we don't think that like dic dictators are going to be supporting things that's going to like endanger the regime. So if you fund these things that's going to like threaten that kind of regime, they're going to say, no, we don't want it anymore, we're going to stop that. So we say, okay, that's not going to help them. But secondly, even if, right, we don't see a real correlation between education level and like, you know, how democratic they are, right? We see China, we see Iran, right? They're very, very educated. Everyone has like a college degree, but so what? They're not like democratic in the least, right? We don't see China or Iran being like promoted as like democracies, right? So we think that, no, that, that cor that's a correlation, not a causation, right? So we say that point falls, right? So then what did, so onto like some reconstruction, right? First you talk about this idea that like, you know, like our side told you that they lack stuff and that's a mischaracterization. When we say, okay, well millions of people in Africa are dying of starvation, dying because they don't have clean water, dying because of malaria and like, Ebola and AIDS and all of these things, we say, no, that's not a mischaracterization. That's just simple fact. They try to simply tell you that's not true. We say, okay, well, there's millions of people dying. How can you really ignore that, right? We say when people are dying, they can't access any other rights. So we don't think, you know, like that's a mischaracterization on our part. Then they talk about this idea of like brain drain, how like less brain drain because there's education. We say, no, that's not true because brain drain happens because there aren't opportunities for jobs, for higher paying jobs. Those jobs are in like more developed countries. That's why they go to those countries, not because there's an education in like their own country, right? So we say that point doesn't even like stand, that kind of reputation doesn't stand. So moving on to my own point, right? Mr. Speaker, I'm going to be talking about why prioritizing directions other than education gives the EU the ability to promote its interests among the country to provide aid to, right? First, you recognize the European Union admits that one of its goals in giving out aid is to promote cooperation between it and its beneficiaries, uh, ben beneficiary countries, right? So how does giving out aid actually accomplish this goal? We say by giving out money to countries, the EU gets leverage with them, right? You can use the um, offer of giving future aid or the threat of evoking existing aid to try and get these countries to cooperate with them, right? So we think that's like beneficial to the EU. We think that the problem with focusing money on education is that a lot more like core authoritarian countries don't necessarily care about this education, or at least not enough to bend in favor of like EU's you know interest in them. And as a result, focusing aid money on education sacrifices like the EU's ability to actually be able to leverage you know uh, these companies uh, like like these. Uh, uh, regimes, right? So let's take a look at two prime examples. Firstly, Nigeria, right? We say they're really, really rich in oil, and they're incredibly important because now Vladimir Putin has, can cut off like the EU's oil supply and they can hold them in hostage, right? So we tell you that when like you know when the EU could leverage Nigeria to give it like more oil, then we think that this could actually help ease the threats that Putin actually puts on like the EU, especially because he's becoming more and more aggressive, right? But we think that unfortunately Nigeria has something of a corrupt government. Education isn't really in the interest of like the ruling political class. And we think that's why they have little to gain from it. And secondly, like Afghanistan, they received like 600 million euros in two years. We think that's incredibly strategically important because the border with Pakistan is like fraught with terrorism. And we think that, it, you know, we need to like have some kind of leverage over it. So what did our side really tell you? We told you that there are a lot of rights that we need to secure before we can secure like the right to education, and they simply asserted the fact that education will come because we provide it. And for those reasons, we're so proud to post. Thank you. So, so proud of the motion today. Okay, as a third speaker for our side, I'm going to be analyzing this debate into two ways. First of all, the impact of education. Second of all, why, would, why invest in education as opposed to other types of work? I'm going to analyze these teams, look at the main points of class that have gone on in this debate, show you why down the bench, side composition really keeps the debate. Okay, let's look at this first thing about the impact of education. What do we tell you on our side? We told you this idea about access to school. 
how when we're building more, how when we're, we're, we're building more schools, there's more regions that have easy access. Now there are more families who can actually easily access school. They don't have to do this dangerous three, three hour long trek to school. They're going to be sending more people to school. When more people are going to school, that's better. They're also going to be more focused on school because they don't have to worry about transportation. What do we hear from them? We basically heard like this weird idea about militant groups and how people still aren't going to go to school. Okay, a few responses. First of all, militant groups still exist on their side of the house. It's a harm that exists on both sides. But it's a harm that's greater on their side of the house. Because if, because if you have to take a three hour trek to go to school every day, that's much more dangerous in terms of, in, in terms of militant terrorist use than if you're only walking for five minutes to school to somewhere that's nearby. We think the harm in militants is much, much worse on their side. But furthermore, we chose the harm for militants like it isn't actually that big a factor at all. We, we think they're greatly over exaggerated the public. Sure, sure there may be like a, a few French terrorists with like, like Boko Haram, but the vast majority of countries don't have these don't have these terrorists and these militants prowling prowling countryside every day and every night looking for innocent children to kill. We think that's a problem that they've greatly exaggerated on their side. We'd also, we'd also tell you this extension to this idea of accessibility <coughs> related to women's rights, right? We would tell you that, that generally a family, if they, can, if they have, say, a boy and a girl and they can only afford to send one, one of them to school, they're going to send the boy. That's bad, for, that, that's bad for the girl, that's bad for women's rights in general. But when they're able to send both people, they're going to send, they're, they're going to send the girl as well. That means more women can get education. It means they're going to have more empowerment, more independence. Ultimately, it's going to be better for women's rights as well. We think that's also a huge benefit on our side. Okay, then we give you this idea of like economic benefits. We analyze this through a few lines, right? We told you how first of all their labor is more valuable, how it contributes more to society. We told you how it breaks the cycle of poverty. We told you about like this idea of, of financial literacy. No thank you. What did they tell you? Basically what they told you was their whole constructive point about how you know there's not enough in infrastructure in the country and there's and there's not enough jobs and like people are just gonna leave the country. A few responses. First of all, brain drain still exists on their side. Smart people are still going to be leaving the country for better things. But it's worse on their side because not only do they not have the, the necessary infrastructure, they also have a very poor education system. That's, that's even worse. Now, now these smart people are going to leave in even greater numbers. This harm is, is, is a harm that's on both sides of the house. Again, one is much worse on their side. But second of all, we tell you that, that the very presence of, of intelligent, educated people in the country is actually going to create this opportunity for employment. Why is this? We, we, we would tell you that for one thing, we, we, when you have when you have like these educated, intelligent workers, they're actually very attractive to to, 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 to you know to, to you know multinational corporations. Their work and their labor encourages and incentivizes corporations to come in and, and, and employ these workers. We think that's beneficial. We would also tell you that when people are more educated, they're going to innovate. They're going to found their own business. They're going to become entrepreneurs. We, we told you that when this happens, this again creates infrastructure. It creates um it, it, it creates jobs and employment in the country. And finally, oh, okay, oh, actually, actually, two more songs. First of all, uh, again, we've been hearing from this side that like we have we have too many specialists and not enough infrastructure. We think that largely it's the other way around, right? Because there's very poor education in these developing countries. Because there aren't enough people who, who are being educated and, and becoming things like doctors and engineers. Because most of them are just going to work in the sweatshop factories. What we actually have is a shortage. Of, a shortage of specialists. We have a lot of gaps in society. We think that's ultimately very harmful. And finally, there's also no economic growth on their side. When when, it come, when when the EU comes in and builds a well and then leaves, we don't see how that creates any economic growth at all. So again, this is a harm that's on both sides of the house. But again, it's much worse on their side. Okay, what did we what did we tell you and what did Anna tell you in her second speech in terms of the impact on education? So so she gave you many ideas, right? First, she told you these, these ideas about like. Hygiene and sex ed, how people are going to like take more care of their hygiene, they're gonna be more sexually aware. Basically the only thing we heard is like people are not gonna listen people are not gonna listen during the classes and like they're not gonna get any any of the any of the information. Okay, a few responses. First of all, when we're talking about hygiene, we're talking about very, very we're largely talking about very, very basic things, such as like how to wash your hands. Yes, we realize that we realize that sounds ridiculous, but it's a very sad and a very huge problem that there are actually a lot of people in the developing world who don't even know simple things like how to wash their hands. We think these hygiene benefits are something that we're gonna see a lot on our side. Okay, so let me give you these ideas about like uh, reducing racism and, cult and cultural prejudice um, and, and this idea of extremism. Basically, basically what they told us is like people still aren't gonna be interacting with people from other cultures. We have a few responses. First of all, like countries are multicultural. We don't think you're gonna have a school where like every single person is of the same race. We don't think we don't think it's like that. We think people are gonna be interacting with people of other races. But, but furthermore, we tell you that schools generally like schools and education generally promote this idea of racial equality, right? They, they promote this idea that all people are equal, that all cultures are equal. But we, we tell you when people are exposed to these kinds of ideas from an early age, when they have when they have these ideas drilled into their heads, it, it, 
it, it, it, it reinforces this idea of cultural equality. It reduces racism when they grow up and become allies. So we think that's a benefit we see on our side. Okay. Then lastly, I have this idea of like how of, of, of like how we're, how we're reducing corruption. Basically, this idea: when people are more educated, they become more informed. They become they demand more transparency transparency from the government. They become more aware of corruption. They become more willing to create change. Basically, the only thing they told us like if a government is a, is dictatorial and it's corrupt, they're like not going to support the education and they're going to like put it in propaganda. Or okay, we tell you when the EU when the EU comes in and builds schools. The government doesn't really have a say in whether they're doing that. Like, it, like for NATO, hopefully we think the government is actually going to be grateful that they're helping their country. We don't think the government is going to like say, okay, no, we're not going to let you build schools because we don't want an educated flat place. We think that no reasonable government would want that because of all the benefits we told you. And um, we'd also tell you that like it's not it's not entirely possible for like the governments to corrupt the curriculum, right? Well, why is this? We, we would tell you that, first of all there's some things that are simply universal and absolute like math and science that they can't be corrupted by propaganda. Second of all, we tell you because this is sanctioned by the EU, we have this degree of objectivity and legitimacy. We don't think this these schools are just gonna be the evidence for government propaganda. Okay. Okay, now that, now that I finished with my with this first theme, let's get into the second theme of like why education in particular. And unfortunately we really didn't get like a whole lot of engagement from this side. So first we give you this idea of, of the right to education, right? But what did they tell you? They basically told you that like that they're like food, water, and shelter are rights to and should be given. Several responses. First of all, this is a gross mischaracterization of the situation in Africa. It's it's not the case that like everybody is starving on the street and dying. We think this is like a very uh, a, a very naive view to take. We think there are a lot of people who do have access to these basic basic necessities. Second of all, we told you that things like food, water, and shelter are actually part of the humanitarian budget, not the develop not the development budget. The humanitarian budget is going to be effective. And and thirdly, and, and thirdly, we would tell you that like when we're giving people education, we're actually giving them the ability to give to provide these things for themselves, right? Instead of throwing food at them, we teach them how to farm so they can grow their own food and become self-sufficient. We think that's ultimately better. And then first thing we also give you many more years. But right? we give you this idea of sustainability, um, instead of just giving things to people, we teach them how to provide them from for themselves. No one gave them some side opposition. And we told you this idea about well, like how, how corporations already have an incentive in the status quo to invest in things like growth and infrastructure, but no need, but no one to invest in education. That's why we need to invest in education. Again, no response. We told you how education is less is less profitable than other forms forms of foreign Again, no one asked. So we think so we think really on our side of the break, we proved to you the benefits of education. We proved to you why we need to be giving people education in particular as opposed to other kinds of boarding. It's on this basis that we are so, so proud of both. I find it kind of odd that the opposition walked into this debate telling us that we were mischaracterizing, we mischaracterizing characterizing the nature of this round. In fact, we think that they're the ones who are pushing this burden onto us. Because under our model, we're still providing the $8.8 .8 billion of substantial aid that the European Union can develop. But instead, we told you we're going to approach more specific policies policies that are more specific in actually developing these countries. And we also told you that the infrastructure and the ability for this education to have any impact has 
to be constructed first, and that can only be done through other forms of development. It's because we want to make this education more efficient and more impactful, we're so proud to continue to stand on policy. Three, three themes in this round. First, wish to develop the economy. Second, human rights. And third, democracy. All right, so first, wish to develop the economy. They give you this idea that, like, uh, that you get a when you get a better education, you can get a valuable specialization job, you can have more GDP. And then they also tell you that it's going to bring you out of the poverty trap. Again, the second thing they tell you is that there's going to be more financial choices. Let's address financial choices first. Because we think that, like, why don't we just show up in schools and deliver these kinds of pro why don't we just show up and deliver these specific kinds of programs, right? They never tell you why we have to have a major primary system that has algebra, that has reading, that has all of these constructs, when we can just tell them how to manage their finances better. We support more specific aid, and that's why we think it doesn't need to be a priority. Because when you make it more specific, you bring down your costs, and it doesn't, it's not like a primary source of aid, right? But we tell you that the education that they give you under their side of the house doesn't actually help because they don't need to know things like algebra in order to make sure that they prevent diseases, right? They don't need to know things like algebra in order to make sure they have better sanitation. So we tell you that the education we give them that's more specific in preventing like sexual, in preventing STDs, in, prevent, in propagating better sanitation is actually better than having them sit in school for hours and read all their twists. We think fundamentally we need to prioritize the development of that society over the development of general arithmetic and other skills, right? But second, we tell you even if this sort of education did work, we give you very, very clear analysis as to why the education system will have no benefit to these children. Because first off, the parents aren't going to let their children go to schools. Because if it comes between sending your child to school and having no guarantee of their success, and making sure they work for you on your farm, and getting some success and putting food on the table, we think they'd rather not start. But secondly, we tell you that they're scared because they don't want their children to be killed by these militants. They just wave this down and say this is a massive mistake. But when the European Union gives the third most amount of aid to Afghanistan, that has a massive prevalence of the Taliban, we think that this is a reality. This is a big problem. And, in these, and even if it wasn't, we think that the perception of these groups as being super powerful also scares these, press, these parents. But third, we tell you that these people are fundamentally unhealthy. We need to provide them with the best sort of medication, the best sort of vaccinations to keep them from these diseases. Because when we look at Nigeria, we tell you that, or, or when we look at, sorry, Sub-Saharan Africa, we tell you that half of the population does not pass primary school because they die of tropical diseases in the vast majority of Sub-Saharan Africa. We tell you when they're so unhealthy, we need to think, work on fixing these problems to make sure that the education we give them, they can actually pay attention to, and they'll actually succeed in, right? All they tell you in response is, well, this is humanitarian aid. Not exactly, ladies and gentlemen. We think that humanitarian aid is sort of temporary aid that you give to them in times of crisis and things like that, right? We think developmental aid is aid with the goal of promoting a long-term result. So as long as we can show you that these kind of supplies, these kind of food, and these kind of better vaccination and better health care promote a longer, sustainable result, we think that is developmental aid that does fall under our side. But third, we tell you that our side solves this issue because, like, sorry, third, we tell you that when these people graduate, they're anyways going to go to other countries. They just tell you, well, brain brain doesn't really exist, and even if it did, it's not exclusive to your side of the house. First off, we tell you that 90% of like Nigerian expats, we brought to you that statistic of how they went to grow, right? But second, we tell you like when at the point which they say that brain brain uh, that brain brain is exclusive under our side of the house, we tell you no. The difference under our side of the house is when you have a working economy, right? When you put things towards proper healthcare systems, when you put things towards funding hospitals, funding projects, then you actually have jobs for these skilled professionals to grow into, rather than having no jobs available. To because a skilled professional who gets a degree in like a very impoverished country won't have any job to go to within that country. He'll be forced to leave somewhere else. But when we do create these kinds of developmental aid programs, we force these individuals into these kinds of jobs. We keep them local, and we think that better supports this idea of brain. That's why it's not exclusive to our side of the house. No, thank you. Second, this question of human rights. They tell you first off that the EU in particular is very good at dealing with this because they have a good education system. Two type, two responses. First, we're giving them a different type of education. Education that helps them develop a society, not general education. We think that's the kind of education that comes after you're able to put food on the table, after your farming systems actually work properly. But, so we want specific education. That's something we never saw them engage with. And second, we told you exactly, right? We still support the European Union giving them educational aid because we understand that they're smart. We just want that aid to be more specific and more efficient. 
And then when we model take them, they never actually address how much this aid was going to be. Is it going to be 50%? Is it going to be like the majority? Or is it going to be a plurality? When we look at cases of like 21, 20, 20, 20, and then a 19, right? We think at the end of the day, they never address exactly how much aid we're going to fund on education. We, tell, we support aid, educational aid, but that that's more specific and focuses on developing society and actually specifically addressing the problems rather than having a generic primary and secondary education. They have to prove to you why these kinds of systems that teach algebra, that teach reading, reading are efficient and actually are the primary focus for these students. We don't need that. Second, they tell you that education is a human right. So the first thing they say is, well, women have better rights under this model. Again, we tell you we're still funding them. But beyond that, what we tell you is when we have specific aid, we can specifically teach women who otherwise would not go to these schools how to prevent themselves from getting raped, how to prevent themselves from getting STDs. But second, when they tell you education is a human right, we think, sure, it is. That's why we're still giving them at that aid. That's why it's still specific. But beyond that, what we tell you is that we need to give them more developmental aid to survive. Because we tell you your right to life is fundamentally important. It is who you are, and you can't exercise any of your other rights, right? So when we have proper infrastructure in terms of healthcare, vaccinations that preserve this right to life, then they can exercise their secondary rights of education and what other rights <coughs> we give them. But even if we tell you that this facilitates like a growing economy, because the fact of the matter is you're developing the economy and you're developing the education. Then they tell you, well, education is less corrupt. We didn't understand this because we tell you all kinds of aid are equally corruptible. But beyond that, what we tell you is that that's a problem with corruption. We should just have better regulations in order to solve this because it's not exclusive to education and aid. Lastly, they tell you this has an incentive to go to school. They say because schools are closer, we do this, right? They tell you militant groups still exist under our set of house. But when you have developmental aid that advances the security and safety forces of the nation, those groups are far less likely to be able to actually target these kids, and there's actually a less chance that they'll be scared of them, because we're actually focusing on investing in funding these security forces that actually help these societies, that protect these societies, right? But lastly, on this idea of democracy, they just tell you that more education means more democratic values, better discourse, right? We tell you, no, if it's a dictatorial regime, they're just going to cut this educational aid. They do have control. But second, they never actually prove the correlation. When we brought up examples of Iran, which is the best educated Middle Eastern country, yet still doesn't have a very democratic government, right? And third, we tell you that to the extent that this education does lead to democracy, these people are still going to go abroad. The best politicians aren't actively going to be in these societies. At the end of the day, it's because we want to keep these people alive. It's because we want to make their education more impactful and more specific in actually developing the society before we give them general education. We're so proud of two of them. more targeted, more specific education, 
because we think that what we need to do is actually teach these people what they need to be able to survive. We think if a village doesn't know how to farm, we think that we should teach them exactly how to do that. We think if a village can't get clean water, we should teach them how to do that. It's because we don't support a blanket solution, we don't think that one fix is actually that covers everything is going to be the solution. We're so proud to stand on side opposition today. So what I'm going to do for you as a summary speaker is summarize this debate in terms of two main themes. First, which world actually provides better education? And then second, which is actually going to have a better long-term benefit? So the first thing though, that we find funny is that they're claiming that, well, our development aid isn't actually going to work because we give it to corrupt governments, therefore like, their model is a lot better, right? We say that actually, under development aid, we give that same money for education to the government to decide how they want to spend it on this educational aid. So we say if they claim that our aid is not going to work, their aid is also not going to work either because we see that under these initiatives, it's actually the government receiving aid that has to go out and build these schools. But then second off, they bring you this point about, well, they say that essentially our work, or that they physically can't get to a lot of these schools, right? That's a problem, we're going to make it closer. We say in a country like Nigeria, for example, they've been focusing on trying to make schools more accessible for people. The problem is in a country like Nigeria, there's still only 59% of the population that actually attend school. Why is this? Because we think in Nigeria, there's a lot of people who simply don't have access to clean water, who don't to have access to food. But even if they did, we think that they don't necessarily have the time available to be able to go to a lot of these schools because they have to help their families and what they need immediately, right? So we think that under that scenario, even if we build closer schools, they're still not going to be able to go. But we also think that a lot of these parents view these schools as useless because the fact it's not going to have immediate tangible benefits, like a lot of these parents see the need right now, schools aren't necessarily going to get them. But then we bring you this point about brain drains, right? And how even if they get these educations, they're still ultimately going to end up leaving for other countries, right? The only thing that they respond is, well, they're going to create more entrepreneurship, therefore they must make the economy better, right? What we tell you is that even if they are going to create entrepreneurship, they're more likely to go to other countries where there are more opportunities to create entrepreneurship, where there are larger markets, where you actually have the infrastructure like roads to be able to sell your product. We think the fundamental difference on our side of the house is we are providing them more infrastructure to actually be able to sell their products even if they wanted to create more of these uh, development programs or uh, entrepreneurship, right? Because now we're building the roads, we're building the ports. We think that's actually going to increase trade. That's what's truly going to build the economy on our side of the house. What do we tell you? We tell you we want specific target education for what those countries need on a blanket solution. We told you we're actually going to build better infrastructure for these schools. And we told you how we're going to be providing them the knowledge about the basic needs that they actually need right now, rather than focusing on something they may potentially need right now. But which is actually going to be better long term, right? We think that they say that they're still spending money on humanitarian aid, right? We think that this is where our model pick comes in. They never actually specify how much their aid is going to be given to education. Is it 50%? Is it 70%? Is it just like a 21, 20, 20, 19? Right? We think they never specify that. We think that even on whatever they say on their side, we're ultimately going to end up spending less money on this humanitarian aid. We're going to have less accessible. We think we have less accessible, we're less effective in dealing with these problems. And we think that the second of all, when the EU says it's our agenda to prioritize education, we think that all these countries are simply only going to focus on education, not building anything else, because we're going to say to receive this aid, we need to fill the EU's mandate that education is the most important, therefore we have to put all our money into spending this education. But second, they bring you this point about how education leads, leads to better democracy, right? And we say that's just empirically untrue. We see like in a country like Afghanistan, which receives the third most aid of any EU development country in the world, they still don't have a democracy a lot of the time, or they, in the fact that they, sorry, they do have a democracy, but it's a very, very corrupt one anyways, right? So we think that even in that sense, it's not actually helping them out. But then last off, they bring in this point, essentially, about how we're going to be creating a better financial decision for a lot of these people, right? And we think that's not necessarily true, because we think that we're not teaching them specifically what they need, we're trying to give them this blanket solution. It's because we don't think that blanket solutions in these countries were impoverished. We think we need specific targeted needs, something we only find in our stance in this debate that we clearly want on our side of the house.
really taken the debate is when the side opposition has fundamentally misunderstood the heart of the debate. They brought to you specific case studies, nitpicky issues, like our model doesn't have a specific number, and they failed to listen to our model in the first place where you played the specificity. It's because of all these nitpicky things that they're trying to cloud their arguments that we're so proud to continue to propose. Okay, before I get into anything else, I'd like to deal with this over-occurring model thing that happens throughout the entire debate. <laughs> Let's clarify, this is a this house believes that motion. It's a principal motion. We defend the idea that education should be prioritized over other things. We don't need to give you that 19.5% of it is going to this and 10.2% is going to this. That's not what we're debating about today. Secondly, if you were listening to my partner Ash's model, we told you that education is not going to be overgeneralized and all We told you how the education and the aid would be based on the needs and climate of the area in which aid is being given. We think because they've harped on this fundamental flaw the entire time, they clearly failed to listen to our case. Okay, now that I've done that, let's get to what actually happened in terms of engagement. Firstly, who had actually better dealt with education? We think that if their first speaker all conceded to our people, they told us that education is very important and that's why they're still giving aid to education. We think the difference between our two sides today is that they don't understand that in countries, developing countries, with little infrastructure for education, it takes a lot of money to build up this infrastructure and that's why we're prioritizing. We'll tell you that the difference between the aids that they're bringing up and the aids that we're bringing up is when you have a lot of money into food, the food quality doesn't get better. But when you have a lot of money into education, the quality of education goes up drastically. The specificity of the education goes up drastically and these are all benefits we propose to you over our side of the house. Okay. We also told you about this idea of access. What did they tell you about this? They told you, okay, you know what, everywhere has Boko Haram, so people are going to go to school anyways. We tell you, first of all, this is an overgeneralization, ladies and gentlemen. At the end of the day, even under their side of the household, by this logic, you're much more likely to go to school if your school is five minutes away and there's Boko Haram in the middle, or if your school is three hours away and there's Boko Haram in the middle. We think this is something extremely important to remember. Okay, secondly, why exactly educational aid over any other sort of aid? We told you, first of all, that educational aid directly links to A, economic development, and B, personal health and hygiene. Because the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, in these places right now, we don't have basic hygiene. We don't have these people learning the skills that they need to learn to keep themselves healthy. What did we hear from this? We heard a little bit of contradictions. We heard from the first speaker that no one's going to listen to sex ed in grade three anyways. And then we heard from the third speaker that we want sex ed, that's the specificity of our motion. We think this is an extreme contradiction on their case. Firstly, nowhere in our model did we state that we're going to be giving third graders sex ed. We told you we support primary and secondary education, and we'd probably allocate the right type of sex ed in the right type of grade, right? But secondly, we told you they failed to listen to our idea about specificity. We told you in our model, we told you in all of our contention how we're going to be catering to the needs of these people, and that's something they didn't ever engage with. Okay, what did they tell you under this theme? They told you about how food and water is really good. We'd agree, food and water is really great. Food and water helps you survive. What we tell you is because food and water is so great, it's categorized as something called humanitarian aid, which is something that we'd still be fighting under our side of the house. But even if this wasn't, we told you about this idea of sustainability that they never really engaged with. We told you how there will always be another person starving, ladies and gentlemen, for us to feed. This problem exists forever. The difference between our side of the house and their side of the house is we're giving these people the means to feed themselves, so we don't have to come in every time they're starving. But they're saying every time you're starving, we should give you food because that's a moral obligation. We think they fundamentally misunderstood this. Finally, what happens to the people? We're going through this very quickly. Firstly, we told you about less corruption, right? We told you how educational aid is the least type of aid to receive under corruption. They just said, no, you know, yours can be corrupted too. No one else is on this. We think we clearly win on this idea that educational aid is the best idea. They told you this idea of brain drain. We told you this idea of how brain drain is much worse when you have A, no educated people, and B, a lot of buildings, right? We don't think it makes any sense for their side to assume, okay, once we build hospitals, these people are also going to be smart, they're going to go into these hospitals. That's not true. Under their side of the house, they have buildings, they have no educated people. On our side of the house, we have educated people who can make buildings and make this kind of innovation. <laughs> Finally, ladies and gentlemen, we'd just like to acknowledge there are many points on our side of the house that were never engaged with. This idea of organic change, this idea of sustainability, the idea that governments right now don't prioritize education, it needs to be prioritized because of this. We think on the end of the day, we proved our benefits, we proved our burden, how we have tangible benefits to the quality of these people's educational life. So at the end of the day, education is a gateway to a better life. We think everyone agrees on this here, and that's why we need to prioritize. Thank you very much.